Here we go. All right, 22 PP in your Pampers. Great. I feel very, I'm in a positional mood. I feel like playing positionally. Let's go D4. Okay, not sure why there are no move sounds. Uh, okay, I just enabled them. There we go. Queen's Gamma declined. Okay, Queen's Gamma declined. That's more, more than fine with us. Let's play Knight C3. And we have previously in, in the speedrun almost exclusively stuck to the Carlsbad variation, which is also what I play in my regular Blitz games. Um, now, Carlsbad is a... It's the name of the variation, but it's also the name of the pawn structure that arises out of this variation. It can also arise in certain other you know, variations on a theme, and it is sort of dictated by the trade on d5. That's the Carlsbad variation. You can also leave the pawn on c4, and the main line is bishop g5. That's the traditional main line. And the Carlsbad, you take on d5 very early, and you release the tension in the center, and you get this structural imbalance where white has an e-pawn and black has a c-pawn, and everything else is symmetrical. But this ostensibly small imbalance creates a very intriguing positional and oftentimes tactical play in the middle game. So now we play this like a regular queen's gambit declined. We bring our bishop to g5. We play e3. We play on the normal queen's gambit moves. But a little bit later when we finish our development, you will see how the Carlsbad structure defines the course of the game. So, okay. So here there's a small subtlety. I like to start with queen c2 in order to prevent the bishop from coming out to f5. You can also play e3, but after e3, bishop f5 is a very annoying, solid line that I'll talk a little bit about after the game. So starting with queen c2 doesn't really have a downside, and it prevents bishop f5. Bishop d6. Okay, so in the Carlsbad, the bishop usually comes out to e7, but this is also a viable uh, developing square, although it doesn't really address the pin, which is why uh, more people like to put their bishop on e7. So here, after bishop d3, we are already threatening the pawn on h7 because the knight is pinned to the queen. So black has to play h6. Of course, we don't give our bishop away for no reason. We keep it on h4. And the main choice that white has in the Carlsbad is uh, concerns where to develop this knight. You can develop it to e2 or to f3. And both moves have clearly defined pluses and minuses. And you can't say that one of these is better than the other. They're both totally viable. Knight f3 is the more traditional developing square for the knight. But when I played the Carlsbad, I have mostly positioned my knight on e2. But in this particular version of the Carlsbad with the bishop on d6, I actually like to play knight f3. And there's a super specific tactical reason for that that I'll expand on after the game. This is not essential to your understanding. So for now, I'm just going to play knight f3 and I'll spell it out later. But we are going to play this very traditionally, knight f3. Okay, black plays bishop e6. And okay, bishop e6, what, what, can, what observations can we make about this move? Well, the first thing that, that occurs to me when I, when I see it is that it relinquishes black's control over the e5 square. And I had an entire speedrun game dedicated to the Pillsbury knight, which you might remember is a knight that sits on e5 in queen's gamma declined positions and is supported by two pawns, the pawn on d4 and a pawn that uh, arrives at f4. And the Pillsbury knight is a very nasty construction uh, that a lot of players don't really know how to face. And oftentimes there is no obvious solution. So you might say, well, let's castle first and then let's decide. But if we castle first, then black will already bring the knight out to d7 and we might lose our opportunity uh, to entrench that knight on e5. So I think we should play this in a principled way and we should stick the knight on e5 while we still have a chance, even before we castle. And if knight bd7, then we shove our pawn to f4 and the Pillsbury knight has been has been born. Notice that another drawback of, you know, the black dark squared bishop not being on e7 and bishop takes e5 d5 is not totally out of the question. Maybe black can play g5 there. So black will save the piece, but he will create just like, you know, gaping weaknesses on the king side. And because we haven't castled yet, we actually might castle queen side if the circumstances are right. If black, you know, black hurts himself on the king side, we very well might still castle queen side. I'm not ruling that out. Knight bd7 and f4. And I think the result of the opening has been pretty successful. So we've gotten the Pillsbury knight. 
And now we need to decide which way we're going to castle. In these positions, you do sometimes castle queenside. It's a very risky approach because we don't have a C pawn, but uh, we, we definitely shouldn't rule it out. Queen C7, okay. Queen C7. So F5, by the way, it does technically win the piece, but actually, wait, let's calculate. F5, what happens after F5? If bishop takes E5, then we can play F takes E6. Black has to recapture on E6. We take on E5. Black takes with the queen. Then we can castle queenside. So F5 actually, I think, does win the piece, and it wins the piece for insufficient compensation. But the funny thing is I'm also very enticed by the prospect of just castling. Our position is so good and the knight is so stable that we can sort of procrastinate on playing f5. I don't think there's all that much that black can do about it. Um, but, okay, in the name of objectivity, I think we should probably consider trapping the bishop with f5 immediately. Yeah, it's, it's actually really hard to decide. Castles leads to a really good position for white where black has no easy way to get rid of the knight, but f5 goes after the bishop, and it probably results in us getting a, a full minor piece for two, for, for only two pawns. Actually, well, let's 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 see what our opponent has in mind. Let's go f5. Yeah, unfortunately, we're losing the Pillsbury knight, but we're exchanging it for a full minor piece, so I think that's a worthy price to pay. Yeah, bishop takes e5, and actually here I think it's very important to start with f takes e6. If we play d takes e5, then after queen takes e5, the pawn on e3 is also hanging with check. So if we play d5 and fe6, then black is going to collect three pawns for the piece. And, I mean, queen takes e3 is going to come with check. So we should first, I think, play f takes e6. Rook takes e6. Now we play d5. And after queen takes e5, we have earned an additional tempo over, uh, over overtaking on e5 immediately. So it's a small little nuance, but it's quite significant. And here I think our best approach is just to say, okay, we're going to give up this pawn on e3. And at first sight, well, then why did we go after the piece? Because black's going to get three pawns for the piece. It's true, but notice that we have two bishops. We have not just the bishop pair. Black simply does not have any bishops. And our bishops are sort of crisscrossing the board. I just feel like once the center opens up, the fact that we have three minor pieces and the fact that this is a middle game is going to really, really hurt black. The big decision we have to make is which way are we going to castle. And because black lacks a minor piece and black lacks attacking firepower, I think we'd be fully justified here just to castle queenside because this deploys our rook a little bit faster. Castling kingside, I don't know, maybe allows some knight g4 related ideas. The king on b1 is actually going to be totally and completely safe. So... Castle's queenside, hopefully this makes sense from an intuitive perspective. And I assume our opponent is going to take on e3. This is the first time that they're thinking. There's also a tricky move, d4. I'm just noticing that the bishop on h4 is undefended. Um, but I'll have to talk about that afterwards. Queen takes e3, king b1. So now we get to sort of the st second stage of the game. We've won a piece. Technically, we're not really ahead in material because black has three pawns, but in the middle game, a minor piece is often worth a lot more than a couple of pawns. That can change in the end game. That can change if the position is like locked up. But if the position is wide open like this, it should be obvious to you that the bishops are superior to black's knights and three pawns. Um, notice that I didn't really care that, oh, black took with check. That did not even enter into my considerations. It doesn't matter, right? Our king is now safe on b1. Okay, so th there's a move here that is literally just begging to be played. Um, there's actually a couple of moves like that. There's rook h1. There's rook h1, which maybe a lot of you are thinking about. But the drawback of rook h1 is that, um, well, rook h1 is a, is a good move, but the queen will move back, let's say, to b6. And then I wouldn't want to trade on e6 and build black up with a better superior pawn center. Trading on e6 here actually helps black and gets black a pretty impressive pawn center. The other move that really comes to mind is bishop d3 to f5, which attacks the rook and it puts pressure on the knight on d7. The bishop, other bishop puts pressure on the other knight. So bishop f5 puts black under a lot of strain. 
the way we can combine these ideas, we can start with rook h e1, get the queen off of our back, and then instead of taking on e6, we can play bishop f5 and trade on our terms with the aim of collecting the e-file, grabbing control of the only open file, which is a very important thing to do. I've shared that piece of advice many times. But let's start with the rook h1, send the queen away. I'm anticipating queen b6, maybe queen c5, uh, either one of these, not going to matter. And queen b6. And let's stick the bishop on f5. Why does the pawn center matter? Well, again, I'll, I'll illustrate some variations after the game, but giving black that e6 pawn would have been a terrible idea. But rook d6 is just self-destruction. Our opponent is trying to keep as many pieces on the board as possible, but he's just blind to the dangers. I mean, the first thing I see when I look at this move, the rook is trapped. I mean, the rook is trapped. Can we attack it? Well, it's in our dark square. Do we have a dark squared bishop? We do. We can play bishop g3, and the rook is trapped. That's it. The game is over. Of course, nothing wrong with the move rook e7. That's probably the move I would play if we didn't have bishop g3, but we do. And we win the rook and we win the game. Yeah, and our opponent just played way too quickly in the middle game. Yeah, this is... Okay, queen c5. But this is a good opportunity to practice being precise, which a lot of people really need a lot of work on. So a lot of people just, oh, yeah, let's take on d6. Of course, nothing wrong with taking the rook. We'll, we'll be up a rook. The game will not be over. Black will still have three pawns. We will still have to demonstrate some technique. But let's try to be clinical because that's what somebody at a, you know, at this level would do. And we have a better move than bishop takes d6. When I see queen c5, I'm noticing that the queens are now aligned with each other. And that creates the possibility for tactics, but not just that, it also creates the possibility for a queen trade. The rook isn't going anywhere, right? The rook is already trapped. We don't need to take it immediately. As long as we keep our two bishops in place, the rook on d6 ain't going anywhere. So the move I'm thinking about is actually knight c3 to e2, dropping the knight back, offering a queen trade. But if the queens are traded, then black is even going to have a hard time getting anything for that rook. The other really good move here is somebody's proposed knight c3 takes b5, same exact idea. If, like, the trade on c2 occurs, then we not only trade queens, which is good because we'll be up a rook, but we also win the pawn on b5. So I think knight takes b5 is maybe even the best move. And we are going to go for it. Knight takes b5. Great move. Yeah, even knight e4 probably was decent, but... This is this is super clinical. And I think our opponent's going to resign shortly. Yeah, now he's now he's thinking, but it's it's a little too late. Yeah, hopefully everybody sees the point of this move. If queen takes b5, then we disattach the queen from the rook and we play bishop takes d6. We're up a full rook. And then you might be like, well, why? but then we didn't get a chance to trade queens. But it doesn't matter. I mean, look at Black's knights in that resulting position. I actually would want to keep the queens on the board here. I think it's faster for us to win by keeping the queens on the board and resigns. Yeah, bit of a lackluster game. But nonetheless, a couple of remarks. So, yeah, this is the Carlsbad. C takes d5. I definitely have, I think, more than one speedrun game in the Carlsbad. Yeah, and, and already after like C, C6, Queen C2, Bishop D6, I was getting hopeful because Bishop D6 is, has long been considered an inaccurate developing square for, for the Bishop. Um, it's long been considered an inaccurate developing square for the Bishop. Usually in the Carlsbad, you see black play Bishop E7. This is the main line. And then white plays E3, castles, Bishop D3, Knight BD7. Um, and here, once again, as, as we did in the game, we have a choice between developing to f3 and developing to e2. And I could not possibly explain all the complexities of the Carlsbad in like one analysis session. So I'll restrict myself with just a couple of general points. Most of the time that I've played this with white, I've gone knight g2. And the main idea of developing the knight to e2 over f3 is that you leave the f pawn free. Now, why is that important? Because there is a traditional plan in the knight g2 carols, but where white goes f3 and e4. It's as simple as that. And white wants to steamroll black off the board 
by eventually pushing the pawn at e5 and then following up with f4. Um, there's like a, a ton of games you can see, especially games played decades ago when, when people with black just did, hadn't fully developed uh, how to achieve counterplay against this. You can see some like incredibly one-sided games in the Carlsbad. I think there's a famous Botvinnik Karas game, if memory serves me right, that I can try to unearth. I had a game in this line that was kind of straightforward in that regard. Let me see if I can find the Botvinnik game. And even if you don't play like 1d4, I think it's generally very a very good idea to just educate yourself on this kind of stuff, is you never know when you can benefit from ideas that you learned in another opening. So they reach the Carlsbad here via the Nimzovich, but okay, yeah, like Karis doesn't play the Nimzovich, he transposes the Queen's Gambit declined, trade bishop g5. Okay, so here you can see Karis plays bishop e7, as is traditional, and you get basically the same position. Karis delays c6 for a bit, and knight g2. Back in Botvinnik's day, this was not quite as common, so Karas didn't really know how to respond to this. So black plays pretty traditionally knight f8. There's that c6 move, and Botvinnik goes rook a b1. So he, a little bit of misdirection. He makes Karas think that he's preparing the classic minority attack, b4, b5, which is the, like, most typical plan in these positions. It's the minority attack, where you would want to advance the pawn to b5 in order to break down Black's queenside pawn chain. That's the traditional positional plan. But suddenly after Karis plays bishop to d6, kind of like our opponent, Bobbini goes king h1, tactical alertness, b4 runs into this classic idea, bishop h2 and knight g4. So Bobbini doesn't miss the tactic. King h1 is a very ingenious defense because you might say, wait, black can still take. But of course, this isn't a check anymore, so white can start by eliminating the knight severing the, the mechanism and then taking the bishop. So knight g6 by Karas, and there's f3 by Bavinik. And watch how quickly everything just comes to a head in the center. First he goes rook e1, he abandons the old plan, and instead focuses on preparing e4. Karas just kind of just starts floundering about knight f6 to d7. It's a mistake, because after the trade, Bavinik's knight comes out to a very nice square. The queen slides over to f2. Very important move, because if you had gone e4 immediately, common problem in the Carlsbad, you're going to lose the pawn on d4. So notice how he puts the queen on f2 so that it protects the d4 pawn after he plays e4. Sometimes the dark squared bishop fulfills this role. I'll show you one of my games where instead of a queen on f2, you put a bishop on f2, but precisely for the same reason. Bishop e6 first, he sticks the knight on f5 to induce a favorable trade, and after queen b6, bang, it's time for e4. And watch how quickly Black's position just collapses. So they trade. Karis says, well, I'm going to try to attack White's center. But Botmanik just keeps advancing e5. And as is very common, when you play e5, you create a nice little pathway for your knight to a beautiful outpost on d6. And you might say, well, but doesn't Black also have an outpost on d5? Of course he does. But just look at the way that White's pieces are beautifully coordinated on the e and f files, all of them aiming in the general direction of, of Black's king on the f7 pawn. And these things, they don't just, you know, happen by accident. Knight d6. Karas says, I got to bring everything back. And now bishop e4 by Botmanik paving the way for the knight to jump into f5. The queen comes into the attack, threatening checkmate, inducing another weakness. Now Botmanik decides to open the c-file and occupy it with his rook. And this is just a means to an end. Karas has to stay connected to the rook on e7. Why is it a means to an end? Because now he lifts the rook up to c3 in order to lift it to h3 and just checkmate black's king. Rook f8, and now a little tactics to end the game. Knight f5 anyway. If g f5, then rook g3 check, knight g7, and queen f6 with unstoppable checkmate. So Karis tries to give up an exchange. Babinik says, no, thank you. Knight h6 check, queen f6, rook cf3. And f7 is now under fire and cannot be defended. The knight, the queen, and both of the rooks are all attacking f7. You've got four attackers, three defenders, and you cannot add another defender. Karis loses the pawn, and shortly thereafter, he loses the game. So this is a classic game, and it's a sort of nice advertisement for the knight g2 Carlsbad. Now, since this game was played in 1952, theory has advanced a lot, and so 
You normally don't see Grandmasters the Black Beasts losing quite like this, but I was able to win a nice game um, some, some years ago in the Carlsbad. And I kind of won in similar fashion, not nearly as smoothly, but it was kind of a similar arc of the game. Let me pull this up. I was playing a GM from Argentina who's pretty old, but very experienced player. And we got the same, exactly the same move order, same position. Here he plays c6 almost immediately, and he plays a more modern uh, variation of black plays a6. And very often, like, black's more modern idea involves counter-striking on the queen side. Black doesn't just sit around and wait for white to play f3 and e4. Black prepares a very quick b7, b5, and sometimes black even plays c5, like Bortnik, like Mikola Bortnik, although c5 runs the risk of creating an IQP structure, which is favorable for white because the knight on e2 also controls the square in front of the pawn. So he plays a6, which is one of the fashionable moves. Rook a d1 and f3. There we go. We're starting to prepare e4. And notice that after bishop e6, bishop h4, rook c8, black or I tuck my bishop away on f2. Much like Botvinnik's queen, now it's the bishop that's going to overprotect d4. Empora plays g6 and king h1. Very important move. If you play e4 immediately, after d, e, f, e, black has this very nasty move, knight g4. And either you have to give away your very valuable dark squared bishop or you get forked on e3. The point of king h1 is that after you play e4, it takes the sting out of knight g4 because the bishop can drop back to g1. b5 and just a3 preventing and stopping black's queenside expansion. And first I played knight f4. So notice that I'm not hurrying with e4. I'm making all the improving moves first, but then I finally struck in with e4. And the attack just went super fast. Bishop e3, occupying the square left behind by the pawn. Knight c e2, accumulating pieces. Trade on e6 and e5. And this is another very important idea. You advance the pawn to e5, and if there is a black pawn on g6, your idea is just to go f4 and f5 and smash through the king side, which is exactly what happens. My opponent tries to create some counterplay, but I didn't care. f4, and after bishop g7, I decided to play the move b3 to force the knight off of c4. Little pawn sack, and now here comes f5. Bang! Just smashing through black's king side. Knight comes out to f4, and already the game is over. Because I've shown this game before, by the way, on, on stream. If f takes e5, the knight e6... And first of all, the knight on a3 is hanging, but also you can play bishop takes f5 with the skewer. So black has to move the bishop back, and now e6 is the crusher. Again, bishop takes e6, knight e6, and you can have your pick between the knight and the pawn. And after bishop g6, we continue exploding black's kingside with g4. f takes g4 is forced, otherwise like gf, and black is just dead lost. Take, take, and now send the queen over to attack. Queen takes g4, and after bishop f7, he resigned because king f8, the pretty win that I saw was bishop e3. And whatever black does, bishop comes to h6 with an immediate win because this is just checkmate. So, yeah, so this is a, a nice, another nice Carlsbad game. Of course, I could show you games where black won and where the, you know, central attack misfired for white. This is far from a refutation of the queen's gamma decline, but I think it's one of the most underrated openings, especially for, you know, D4 players in the 2000, 2200 range. Almost everybody tends to go for, like, the traditional main line, bishop g5, or people play the Catalan and stuff, but Carlsbad hasn't gotten enough love, I think, especially from the white side, because the plans are easy to learn, and black's counterplay is, is hard to attain if you're not a specialist. So we go back to the game. All right. So in the game... Black played this, of course, a little bit differently with the bishop on d6, but it didn't change the way that we developed. Oh, well, it did actually change the way we developed our pieces. I decided to play knight f3. And the main reason for that is that knight g2, while totally viable, runs into knight bd7. And the problem is that after white castles, black has, to my knowledge, this annoying idea of bishop takes h2 and knight g4 check. And I wasn't totally sure what the evaluation of this speculative but potentially very dangerous idea is. Um, now, you might look at this and say, well, but the king can move up and it can defend the bishop. True. 
But after king, let's say king h3, black can just play knight df6. And suddenly the king has been, has been drawn into this. Uh, it's caught on the crossfire. It can't go back to h2. There's discoveries. There's g5. And this is just a very messy position. Same goes for king g3. Black can go knight df6. So knight h5 is, is a very dangerous threat. And if white takes it, after queen takes f6, the king is... Again, it's just stuck in the middle of all these attacking pieces, much like the Greek gift sacrifice. So, yeah, so I was annoyed by this idea. And of course, you can play h3 to prevent bishop takes h2 from existing. But if you play h3, then later on when you play f3, you're going to create a pretty big hole on, on g3. So that's a move you normally want to avoid if you're preparing the f3, e4 plan in the Carlsbad. So for that reason, I decided to play more traditionally with knight f3. Okay, bishop e6, I think, is fine. After knight e5, this is where I think black, our opponent, started to go wrong. I think knight bd7 is very cooperative, but after f4, yeah, and after f4, I, I already think black is in trouble because f5 is a big threat. There's just no way, no good way to deal with this knight. I think what black had to do was try to undermine this knight at all costs and to do it immediately. Like black cannot delay because if white plays f4 and the knight is entrenched, then the, the, the ship has sailed. So what's the move that tries to undermine the Pillsbury knight? Well, g5 doesn't, g5 just makes it worse because after bishop g3, you've created a permanent and massive weakness on the king side, which I can then attack with h4. The move is c5. Yeah, c5. You, you try to get at the root of the knight. You go c5, and the other benefit of this move is that it opens up the c6 square for the knight. So let's say white castles king side. Here, I think the position is probably about equal, maybe a tiny bit better for white, but black can play cd, ed, and knight c6. And this has forced the knight trade because if white plays f4, we drop one of the anchors of the Pillsbury knight. That's not, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's unthinkable. And of course, white can play knight takes c6, and now we get this sort of hanging pawn structure, which I think the position is probably about balanced. Maybe white is a tiny bit better. The pawn on c6 is a little bit of a weakness, and you can try to attack it by, well, you can try to blockade it by getting the knight around to c5, which is another very traditional way to fight that pawn. Um, so if I had to pick a side here, I'd pick white, but compared to the game, this is so much, so much more palatable for black. After c5, you could also castle queenside. And this just leads to a very sharp position. But I, I wouldn't have gone for this. This, to me, queen a5, like the c file is open. Black can still play knight c6. And if you trade, now the b file is open. Black can put a rook on b8. White's attack is a lot less, uh, you know, just a lot less fast in this, in this case. So in the event of c5, we would have castled kingside. Um... But in any case, uh, knight bd7, f4, and queen c7, of course, gives up the piece. And I am looking with the engine. What's interesting is that f5 actually is, well, it's saying it's much better, but inaccurate. It actually is giving castle short as the best move. So maybe we should have just been patient and, and see what happens. Because black has, like, literally no defense to f5. The move that made me avoid castles is actually knight d7, f8. And here... Of course, the first thing that you probably see is that white can play bishop takes f6 and permanently ruin the kingside pawn structure. But the downside is that the knight now has to evacuate e5. So obviously, white is much better here. You could swing the queen from f2 to h4 and attack black's weak pawns. The bishop is aiming at the king. It's like plus 1.8 here. Totally reasonable. Um, so maybe this was a more... Uh, Surgical continuation. ZX consumed asks, Rook F3 instead of... Okay, so first of all, Rook F3 instead of Knight F3 has been proposed. I don't know if it's worth sacrificing the Knight, though. I, I don't doubt that White has tremendous compensation. Maybe you can even mate Black with some sort of Queen E2, Queen H5 maneuver. But this has to be calculated very carefully. But very, very much possible that this is, in fact, the best way to play. Like Queen E2 and Queen H5 is already a huge threat. So definitely, yeah, rook f3 needs to be calculated. There was another question, if we rewind a little bit earlier, after c5, 
why not bishop f2 oh after c5 f4 cd ed knight c6 why not bishop f2 defending the pawn yeah this is fine but i don't want to allow knight b4 and one of the drawbacks of the pillsbury knight is that of course you're creating a weak square on e4 oftentimes that square on e4 is well protected by the minor pieces so it doesn't really show up on the surface but if the bishop is eliminated then black can stick a knight on e4 and white's position starts collapsing in the blink of an eye so for example like queen let's say queen e2 trade already black can play the move knight e4 and you might say well this just blunders upon but don't miss the forest for the trees in evacuating the knight out of f6 black has paved the way for f6 pawn f6 and white is busted white just loses the knight on e5 we move the knight back we haven't even castled yet so moving the bishop we actually wins the queen um i think knight e5 is still a good move i think it's a very testing move i think it's a testing move um and i think it forces black to play very accurately so i i stand by the fact that knight e5 is is a great move and the way it happened we played f5 and here i think another mistake by black to give away the dark scored bishop the fact is just giving away both bishops leads to a situation where it's very hard to contain white's initiative. I think black's last chance was probably to play knight takes e5 and give the piece up like this. And here black is not even aiming to get all three pawns back, but at least black keeps the dark squared bishop, which is exerting its influence over both sides of the board. And here I think the game continues. I was planning to still castle queenside, but okay maybe black can try something like b5 white is definitely should should be winning with best play but i think this is a little bit more double-edged with black maintaining the dark square bishop after bishop b5 again important subtlety we start with f takes e6 if we had started with de after queen takes e5 fe there's queen takes e3 check which is an unnecessary thing to allow still good for white after queen e2 but this trades queens, and as we already discussed, we actually don't really want to trade queens here, unless we have to. Okay. So, f takes e6. Now, the knight is attacked, and the bishop is attacked, so black has to give up a piece. Rook e6, de, queen e5, and another important moment. I think a lot of people here, you guys might think, oh, well, of course we castle. But I think a lot of people would be tempted to play bishop f2 or, like, knight d1. Because in my experience, like tons of people are kind of servants to their pawns. And, and you don't think about giving away a pawn like this in the center. But knight d1 is a good example of, you know, two looking at the position in a kind of nearsighted manner. Because you're, you're defending a pawn that not only doesn't need to be defended, but you're making your pieces passive as a result. And you're giving black a potential initiative. And if bishop f2, then maybe you're allowing d4. And all of this is totally unnecessary. For the small price of another pawn, you can open up the e-file to your favor, even though currently black is the one controlling it. That's not sustainable. We're going to play rook e1 to chase the queen away and bishop f5 to chase the rook away. So control of the e-file is going to change hands. And we have ensured long-term safety of our king so we can focus on exploiting our extra piece. Okay, b5 makes matters worse because it doesn't address the issue of rook e1 at all. And after queen c b6, bishop f5, I think it's already pretty much lost. But the last chance for black, of course, is to play rook takes e1 and just keep playing. I don't know, takes queen d4 or something, and maybe a5. But okay, the, the position is the position is is terrible. We can play g4, g5. Black is totally paralyzed here. Okay, rook d6, bishop g3 is is game over immediately. Queen c5, and knight takes b5 is indeed the best move. Uh, this is the most the most clinical if c takes b5 then we first take the queen and then we take the full rook we win the rook um question by sir yo -Jur. would wouldn't d4 wouldn't d4 would have been good instead of taking with the queen let's see i'm not sure oh d4 here no but d4 here ah yeah, yeah i did mention this move this is a trap you don't want to play ed because you drop the bishop on h4. Loose pieces drop off. But white has many ways to circumvent this. The absolute simplest is to first play bishop takes f6. And if knight takes f6, then we can very safely take on d4. And black can't even recapture because of bishop h7 winning the queen. So 
this would be one way to address it. But nothing wrong with just dropping the knight back to e2. And yeah, you're allowing a pawn to get to e3. Big deal. It's blockaded by the knight. And we can go rook h to f1, go rook f5 or bishop f5. Now we have the d file. Again, black just cannot coordinate and control all of the key squares with these two incredibly lame knights on d7 and f6. So that um, maybe still would have been the best defensive resource, d4. The, the engine says knight g4 uh, gave the most practical chances. Bishop g3. And now not queen takes e3, but actually knight takes e3. Counterattacking um, the queen. Bishop takes e5, knight takes c2. Now we have the desperado move. Bishop takes g7. Knight drops back to e3, attacking the rook. This is the engine line, bishop d4. And you actually do give away an exchange, and you get two bishops for the rook. But these are two monster bishops. White's got control over the center. And here white is significantly better, but maybe not completely winning. Also like plus 1.5. So after knight g4, maybe black maintained uh, reasonable defensive chances. Queen takes e3 actually seems to be a serious mistake. Um, because now the queen is in an incredible, incredibly vulnerable spot. Get the rook back to e1, bishop f5, and bishop g3 to trap the rook and win the game. And that's all that I have to say. Yeah, that was a pretty, to be honest, a pretty lackluster game, but I'm still going to put this up on YouTube, and I, I still think there's utility to be derived from it. Um, I'm also going to do an analysis of Fabi's best game from the U.S. Championship and put that up as well. So you have a lot to look forward to. But let's pause here for today, guys. This has been a well, three-plus hours, so I think that's a, that's a good... Good spot to end. When will I start a new speedrun? I don't know if I will start a new speedrun. When we hit 2300, we're like 18 points away. I will re retire this speedrun. And then we'll probably start a new one at some point, but I don't know when that'll be. And I don't, you know, I don't know which direction I'm going to take YouTube in. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks for hanging out.